I bought this uh, cordless brushless weed whacker and I thought I'd have a look inside the motor and make a video about it. Well, I guess this is the motor with the coils on the stator. Let's pop that open. These screws are all threaded into plastic. And here's the uh, rotor, which now wants to stick to the stator because of the powerful magnets there. Uh -huh. Nice metal gear. Well, it seems I have a bit of slack on those wires. So all that just to verify that uh, it should be safe to pull this off. Man, that magnet really pulls it on there. So we've got a rotor with some strong permanent magnets on it. And we have a south pole here, the north points at it. And then the reverse, reverse, reverse. So we have two north and two south poles on this rotor. And the stator has got uh, six poles on it. I'll just put it back on for now. We've got three terminals here. Each terminal has got four wires coming off of it. And we've got six coils. Each coil has, of course, two wires coming off of it. And uh, each pair of terminals has two coils hooked up to it. And they're in parallel. For instance, you can see there's a wire that goes to this coil here, and then the other end comes to here. And then there's a long wire that goes around here to this coil, and then around here to this coil. So these two coils are in parallel, but they're such that they're of opposite polarity, so that these will both have north or south. So the motor would work by, for instance, putting a north on here, and then say next thing is it puts north here and south on these two, and then kind of gradually bridges around to create this four-pole rotating magnetic field using the six coils. Again, like you would have, for instance, north on both of these and south on these ones, then changing to maybe south on here and north on these two coils and create that rotating field. It's all a little bit approximate, which is why you get uh, quite a lot of uh, cogging sort of thing happening. The, the rotor really prefers certain angles. Let's put the uh, top of that motor back on. And with the bearing back on, the motor and this metal gear here now spin freely again. So I just carefully counted the uh, teeth on the uh, motor gear. That has 20 teeth. This one's got 60 teeth, so we have a 3 to 1 reduction from the motor to the spool. Okay, good. I haven't busted it yet. With no electronics by the motor, I figure they must be in the big bulge on the back. Well, I'm afraid I just have to avoid the warranty on this thing. Whoops. So we have the battery terminals here that go to probably an epoxy blob of electronics. You can see some capacitors sticking out of it there. So unfortunately I can't really get into that without wrecking everything, which I'm not willing to do. And then this rod goes to the uh, trigger, and this is the uh, safety release catch, and when I pull that trigger, that pulls on the rod, pushes on this thing here, which tells this thing to go faster. And then we also have some wires that go along here to this little switch, and that switch is high-low mode. Well, nothing more to see in there, so I'm putting that part back together. Let's get some screws in here quick before it comes apart again. So now I have my USB scope hooked up between two of the phases on this motor. And as I turn this motor, that creates an AC waveform on here, which looks rather squiggly, but if I turn it faster, it becomes bigger and uh, much smoother looking. In fact, that looks pretty nice and sinusoidal once the motor is going fast enough. I think the reason often it isn't sinusoidal is because there's a bit of gearing backlash and if I turn it slowly there's always a little bit of rattling in there as the uh, motor wants to cog into 12 different positions and the gear's got a bit of play and that's what makes all this rattling sound too. 
Now if we look at this uh, curve that came out of the motor, if I'm turning it passively, the area underneath the curve here, here, and here, and here is always the same and as the frequency slows down, the height becomes less. And if we look at this bit here, the time between those two makes for 57 Hertz and the voltage is about 1.6 here and 1.49 volts here. So my voltage at 57 Hertz is 1.55 volts. That's 3.1 volts peak to peak. The battery provides 18 volts when it's getting low. Divide that by 3.1, which means we can turn 5.8 times faster. We can put about 370 Hertz in there before we run out of battery voltage to actually provide the waveform. But it's a four pole motor, so it has two cycles per turn, which means we get 185 turns per second times 60 is 11,000 RPM. So let's see what waveforms we get in that motor when we're actually running it. So this is kind of interesting because the waveform here is 320 Hertz and where the cursor is it's at 19 volts and of course it goes negative by the same amount which is to say our peak to peak is actually 38 volts. I hadn't thought about this but uh, of course you can just swap the terminals essentially from the battery and that gives you uh, double the peak to peak voltage but uh, we have basically substantial driving here and then we have nothing coming out here it's almost like the electronics is suppressing what's coming out of the motor to try to slow it down and then give it lots of power and then suppress it again really weird so now I've captured going fairly fast and then letting go of the trigger so this is just a back EMF generated by the motor. Uh, let's zoom in on that a little bit. And I think this is, to me, it looks like here it's driving the motor, realized it went too fast, and then it's trying to slow it down again. And here I let go of the trigger, and now we've just got the back EMF generating a smooth waveform. And this is going back to the slowest I could run it at, and the frequency here is about 300 hertz, still the same voltage, but it looks like it's trying to drive the motor as hard as possible and then suppressing it and driving it hard again instead of doing a PWM to get some kind of intermediate voltage. Now it would be much more efficient to use PWM to approximate uh, lower voltage instead of just driving it full and then breaking it in between as the motor gets too fast. And squeezing the trigger to the max I got 583 hertz. That works out to 17,500 RPM. So the way they're driving this motor, it's kind of comparable to driving a car and you either have your foot full on the accelerator or moderately on the brake and to get intermediate speeds you just alternate between the accelerator and the brake. Just stupid. So I was thinking maybe it's because I didn't have anything on here because this stuff provides quite a bit of moment of inertia. So I put this back together and now let's monitor the waveforms this way. Nope, still the same stupid waveform. It just boggles the mind. The whole idea of a brushless tool is to make it efficient. Why do they waste energy like this? I mean, really, you could just drive it up to speed and then let it idle. Why do you have to break it? So I just put the tool back together and I put a coil here to inductively pick up what's going on inside the uh, coils of the motor just to see if I can probe that without opening the tool. And we pretty much still have the same thing here we're driving it. There's some spikes on the transitions but in between we can see the uh, magnetic field is being suppressed because the coils are shorted and then it's driving it again. So I can actually sense this without taking the tool apart and I'm curious if other tools use a similarly stupid approach. Okay, the Walt Angle Grinder. I see no signs of uh, power and braking ultimately on this one, so that's good. And now a brushless drill from Canadian Tire. And I also don't see this kind of stupidity with this drill. I see here a waveform right there that's about uh, 200 Hertz 
So that would mean if it's a four pole motor that's turning about 6,000 RPM. And then I see these pulses that are about one and a quarter milliseconds long. So I think instead of PWMing it, every once in a while it just drives it hard for a full part of a cycle and then lets it go for a few cycles. And with this DeWalt impact driver, it seems we have occasionally very narrow spikes driving it for maybe just part of a cycle and if I hit it harder those spikes become a fair bit wider so I guess it uses that to get more power into it but it's still not PWMing through the whole uh, sinusoidal wave cycle at all unless we run it at full speed at which point uh, I guess it's probably powering through the whole cycle and this is where I let off on the trigger and the uh, braking took over and stopped the motor. So it seems none of the uh, brushless tools that I played around with use a traditional PWM to kind of approximate a sinusoid that would be ideal for the motor but uh, I imagine it's probably not that bad except for what that weed trimmer does which just seems idiotic. So if you've got in-depth experience on brushless motors beyond just what the textbooks say let me know what you think is going on here. Again, don't give me the basics. I know the basics. There's something strange happening with that uh, weed trimmer.